This is Joseph Morecambe's fine sculpture of the close friend and disciple of Jesus. Looked at from the ground level, he presents a rather grim face, you might even say miserable. But that's not fair. He is really rather noble with his pilgrim staff and book. But in reality, he had no book. By the time of his death, the New Testament was still being written. If he wrote anything, it's not come down to us. Though there is a letter in his name in the New Testament, which scholars say could not have been written by him. It belongs to a later period of the early church. Now, let's go in. And here, as we enter, is the baptismal font, the way by which most Christians start their journey to God in the faith. Joseph Morecambe has carved some lovely child angels in oak to adorn the cover, as if to underline the great musical tradition and activities which take place in this building they're playing instruments. Two are playing cymbals, one a small harp, and one a Renaissance cornet. Here also at the west end of the church is Robert Newbery's fine, large, beautifully colored window showing the shepherds worshiping the Christ child with his mother Mary. Right at the top of the window is an ornamental monogram, which looks like IHS. But in fact, it is the first three letters of Jesus' name, Jesu, in Greek. This is often to be seen in churches, and it underlines the repeated assertion that all Christians do what they do in the name of Jesus. Well, I do believe that Newbury has been innovative in including on the left a woman with a boy in front of her. It is unlikely, but could this be in his imagination, Mary's cousin Elizabeth and her cousin John, perhaps? Or is it a portrait of the dedicatee, Mrs. Annie Raven? We don't know. Here is a fine house of God. It is not just a convenient building to have services in. It is a space open for our discovery of God, helping us to see all space, every place, as a centre for God's loving presence, as Rowan Williams writes. The building was started in 1899 and more or less finished by 1914. As we enter, 
and see the interior stretching away to the high altar, we can see that this is no ordinary church, but one on which great care and attention has been lavished, particularly by the architect Henry Goddard. He was influenced by a visit to Torcello Cathedral, which is near Venice. Well, now let's go further in and lift thine eyes, not to the mountains, but to the terracotta capitals at the top of each of these 22 pillars. There are a host of angels here, at least 365 of them, and one for each day of the year. Now, like most people these days, I'm a bit skeptical about angels, but I do think they're a very good metaphor for those mysterious things that happen to us for good. And when we can say to some kind and helpful person, you are an angel. After all, in the Bible, angels are always messengers of God. It's hardly surprising then that the words that follow come at the climax of the Eucharist every Sunday in most churches. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And I think the angels at the back of the church are probably archangels. The big one at the top almost certainly is. And as we've seen, there is glory outside too. Angels are a very good introduction to St. James because he shared in their glory when he was present at the transfiguration of Jesus. And we'll come to that story later. Also, according to St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the risen Lord Jesus appeared personally to James. There are other images at the top of the capitals. These are sheep's heads, not goats, I think. Now, why sheep? Is the architect harking back to the medieval mason's mockery? Because sheep are rather silly things. Is it a joke? Well, I don't think so. It's more likely to refer to the fact that in many places in the Bible, there are references to sheep and shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd, and we are the sheep of his pasture. And of course, all we like sheep have gone astray in Handel's Messiah. But now, as we progress into the church, there are four stained glass windows by a lady artist called Theodora Salisbury, who left her signature in the form of a small peacock on her windows. Her family lived next door to the church, a house which has been the vicarage ever since that family left. And here there are angels around the windows as well. In the north aisle, there's a World War I memorial 
and the window above it is the memorial window. Typical arts and crafts colouring, deep reds, greens and purples of St Michael in armour with the inscription, live as nobly as they died. There are only a few names of the fallen below this window because most who died from this parish are remembered elsewhere. <laughs> Now, there are three windows over here on the south side. A window dedicated to D.C. Robertson, who was the organist from 1934 to 1950. The window depicts David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And Theodora wrote in the Parish Magazine, the mountains seen through the arch in the background symbolize aspiration and inspiration from which flow all lively things, joy, beauty, truth, and brave imaginings. And then right down at the end, there's a window which shows the chalice and pattern, the vessels for Holy Communion. The inscription AMDG stands for Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam, to the greater glory of God. And it was installed in memory of the first vicar of St. James, Charles Edward O'Connor Fenton. Theodora's fourth contribution was the Bates window up here, installed in 1939 and it depicts Jesus with the children. She wrote in the parish magazine, one child offers Christ flowers and her ball, and the baby is about to give his most prized possession, the little wooden horse. The vine is a favorite symbol of the chosen people, the Jews, and there are doves of peace and daisies which patterned the grass at his feet. As we go up to the sanctuary, we pass some beautiful faience angels in groups holding an inscription, O oh, praise the Lord of heaven, and then round the corner, sing ye praises, and over on the other side, rejoice in him, praise him in the height. This Majolica work, as it's called, is influenced by the work of the 17th century artist Della Robbia, notably in Florence. And when we get to the altar, there are some skillfully executed semi-relief wood carvings in oak on the front of the altar. Angels again, playing musical instruments. Now, we have moved to the sanctuary to look at three scenes from the life of St. James. These were all painted, most probably, by Diana Goddard. I like to think of her smoking her pipe, climbing up the scaffolding to paint late at night. There's a story recounted in the Parish Magazine of that time of her painting at 2 a.m. and the light streaming out of the church windows outside. A policeman noticed and was worried, <laughs> so he woke the verger and the vicar and called up reinforcements before making his way into the church to find no burglar but Diana Goddard busy painting and, I suspect, smoking. First of all, behind me, the call of four of the disciples. Now here, Jesus is shown at the point when he was, has just called Simon Peter and Andrew his brother, saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then, a little later, he finds the sons 
of the fishermen Zebedee, James and John, mending their nets. And he calls the young men. Now, I think these people had known one another for years on the shores of Galilee and that they had talked about starting a movement centered around the kingdom of God. And I think that this was the moment when Jesus says, right, lads, it's time we started our mission. And it is to me completely astonishing to think that what we know as the Church of Christ began here with these ordinary fishermen. James and John must have been pretty forceful characters because Jesus gave them the nickname Boanerges, Sons of Thunder. Another interesting thing is the faintly visible background. Diana has sketched in the town of Galilee and the hills above. This picture of the Transfiguration is the centerpiece of the lovely Riridos, with a carved cupola and carved angels designed also by Joseph Morcom. But the important thing is that this picture represents a central incident in the lives of Jesus, Peter, James and John. Jesus very close friends. Superficially, it reads like the four of them going out for a ramble in the countryside with a bit of a climb. But symbolically and mystically, the climax of the trip on the top of the mountain is an event which must have been deeply shocking and deeply moving. The three gospel accounts are remarkably similar and describe Jesus being transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became white as light. Stranger still, two other figures were seen with him, Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now Moses was the archetypal leader who led the people of Israel out of slavery and gave the Ten Commandments to Israel, perhaps about 1,300 years before Christ. And Elijah, who came later in the 9th century BC, was the great prophet who overcame the corrupt King Ahab and his cruel wife Jezebel and led his people against the seductive pagan religion of Baal worship. These figures represent the traditions of the law and the prophets, which Jesus himself claimed to continue. But for me, I am captivated by the mystical quality of this event. And Diana Goddard has imaginatively shown this quality. St. Mark's Gospel reports that a voice came out of the mystical cloud saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. <laughs> now Diana has shown this by painting the back view of perhaps Peter with cupped hands, listening, Diana Goddard's second mural shows the trial of James and implies his death by execution with the sword. There is very little doubt that there was a persecution of the Jewish Christians shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection. Both the Roman rulers and the Jewish kings hated the threat represented by the Christians because of their absolute honesty and speaking truth to power. But there is a strange element in this mural. It's obvious that the two ruling powers are depicted by the Roman centurion carrying his sword and 
King Herod Agrippa with his Negro slave on the right. But Diana has inserted a figure in prayer between James with the golden halo and King Agrippa. Now, in his history of the Church of St. James the Greater, century to millennium, Alan McQuirr gives this explanation. A mysterious figure kneels alongside James in prayer, almost certainly the accuser of James, who was so moved by the constancy and courage which James showed at his trial that he too became a Christian and was condemned to be beheaded. Our problem is that there is absolutely no source for this tale, and I cannot find it in the often highly imaginative apocryphal literature. On this side, the background is Jerusalem and its temple. There is also a bit of controversy about how James died. The New Testament says in the Acts of the Apostles that he died by the sword. But the Jewish historian Josephus, in his Antiquities, reports that he was stoned to death. Since we know that this was a particularly Jewish method of execution, remember St. Stephen, it may well be true. Also, the word martyr comes from the Greek meaning to witness, and it is certain that James witnessed to Christ in his death during a typical persecution of Christians, probably by both Romans and Jewish leaders. <laughs> At the next level above, there are large faience or majolica figures of St. James with the four gospel writers and St. Peter. Um, the gospel writers each have their identifying symbols and these are difficult to see, but I hope you can distinguish James with his staff and book, Matthew with an angel in the folds of his cloak in his left hand, Mark with the head of a lion representing royal dignity, St. Luke with the head of a winged bull representing sacrifice and strength, and John with the head of an eagle, which is a very far-seeing bird. And finally, in the level above that, we have the stars in the cupola. The constellations here are those seen in the September night sky looking north. You can see the great bear, or the plough, and the little bear above, and Cassiopeia, like a W on the right. So here we are in the Lady Chapel, and we have above the night sky in December facing south. You can see Orion in the middle and the bull, Taurus, top right, and the twins, Gemini, top left. Of course, the religious meaning is in the wonder of it all, as we gaze at the myriads of light in the heavens. At least 3,000 years ago, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 8, For I will consider thy heavens, even the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. In the next layer down, there are three fine windows by the nationally known glass artist, Robert Newbery, in this chapel. These smaller ones made to fit the narrow windows in the apse of the Lady Chapel include a somewhat conventional but well-executed crucifixion in the center. Note the fine 
ornamental nimbus and the cloth as a background to the figure, emphasizing the glory of Jesus on the cross. Christianity insists that despite the horror of his torture and death, Jesus was actually glorified by the choice, by his choice, and the manner in which he died. On the left is the Virgin Mary, and St. John is on the right. The latter shows him holding a chalice. There is no Last Supper account in St. John's Gospel. Instead, attached to the story of the feeding of the 5,000, there is an extensive meditation about Jesus as the bread of heaven, his own flesh, given for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. This must be understood as a massive metaphor for the relationship of Christian people and Jesus. Obviously, there has been considerable development in Christian thought by the later part of the first century to have arrived at this stage, which is so familiar to us today as Christians attend the Eucharist Sunday by Sunday. Here on the south side of the Lady Chapel is the stained or painted glass by Robert Anning Bell. It shows a trio of Jewish women. The first panel shows Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, who was pregnant with the boy who became John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is in that picture. Mary visited her when she was pregnant with Jesus, and we'll come to that later. The second window shows Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the inscription is a verse in the Gospel where St. Luke writes, and Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The third panel shows a picture of Hannah, whose story is in the Hebrew Testament in the first book of Samuel. And this, of course, is uh, more than a thousand years before. She was the mother of the great prophet Samuel, who became a leader of Israel. Like Elizabeth, 1,500 years later, she and her husband had no child, and she was getting on in years. So she journeyed to the temple in Jerusalem to pray for a child. And while she was there praying on the temple steps, she was accused by the priest of being drunk. But when she protested that she was not drunk, he said, your prayer will be granted. And she made a promise then that the child would be dedicated to the temple. And this reminds me of a contemporary miracle for a member of Our Lady's Choir, a Japanese lady, Hiroe Kawana, who had been told by her doctor in Japan that she would be unlikely to have a child. But while here in Leicester, she became pregnant and her first child, Kotone, which means harp, is now 15. And I met the family in Japan four years ago. I have referred to this part of the church as the Lady Chapel. And there are, of course, a lot of ladies shown here. But the architect originally designated this as the Day Chapel. I suppose because a lot of daylight comes in on the south side. These days, the Church of England is still recovering part of its Catholic heritage. And since we use the Lord's Prayer from the Gospels, so we may also use the Hail Mary from the Gospel of St. Luke. These are the words of Elizabeth when she visited the pregnant mother of Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed 
is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The modern sculpture here of Our Lady Mary is by Peter Ball. And I've referred to Peter Ball in another video. It was given recently to the church in memory of my own mother and the mother of Paul Winston, who died a few years ago and who lived in this parish. Peter Ball often uses marine timber for his work. We have now made our pilgrimage right round the church and returned to where we started. We have really traced many of the stages of the Christian life, beginning with baptism and following through to the revelation of many of the ways of God with people, especially as exemplified by the brave journey of the Christian martyr St. James. There is a legend that the bones of St. James were eventually taken to St. James Church in Compostela in northern Spain. There, he continues to be revered so that the place has become a very popular pilgrimage centre of inspiration for Christian renewal from all over Europe and further afield. So today, I hope you will be inspired by this visit to Leicester's St. James the Greater Church.